Welcome everybody uh, and thank you to those joining us live um, and to those who are listening in afterwards. I'd also likely um, like to warmly welcome our guest uh, today whom I'll introduce shortly. Our webinar today is titled Empowering Self-Care Through Pharmacy, Guidelines and Resources for Pharmacists. And it's a very important area for pharmacy and an area of my own research I'm extremely passionate about. Self-care is an integral part of healthcare systems contributing to healthcare costs, uh, savings, better allocation of resources and improved health outcomes in the population. Pharmacists are well placed in the community to support health related decisions and facilitate informed self care. FIP aims to support pharmacists in this role through advocacy and by developing professional resources in the area of self care. This event will showcase a variety of FIP publications including the launch of our new handbook. As has been demonstrated in uh, previous webinars in the self-care series, self-care is a fundamental aspect of pharmacy practice and could be better supported in healthcare systems more broadly. We primarily think of pharmacists' role in self-care with minor ailments, triage, and facilitating self-medication processes, but it extends beyond that. Self-care includes prevention, detection, and chronic disease. We know that pharmacies are the most frequently visited healthcare destinations in most, most developed countries, and community pharmacists are one of the most accessible healthcare professionals. Pharmacists already play a critical role in supporting self-care and are well-placed to further promote self-care practices and behavior change in each of these areas. Our speakers today will explore self-care in further detail in this webinar. Next slide, please. Uh, but first, to introduce myself, I'm Dr. Sarah Deneen Griffin, a pharmacist from Australia. My current position is as a lecturer in pharmacy practice at the University of Newcastle in Australia. I am a FIP's a Community Pharmacy Section Expo member, FIP's Vice Chair for the New Generation of Pharmaceutical Sciences Special Interest Group, as well as Vice Chair, um, sorry, Vice President of the New South Wales Branch of the Pharmaceutical Society of Australia. We'll now move to the announcements. So as you can see uh, on this slide, we have a few announcements uh, for our webinar. Please note this uh, uh, event, sorry, will be recorded, live streamed on FIP YouTube and will be available at www.fip.org. To all those listening, please feel free to send your questions using the Q&A box. And I will do my best to manage all the questions so that our panelists will be able to answer those at the end of tonight's session. You are also welcome to provide any feedback to webinars at FIP.org and a certificate of attendance will be sent to all of you uh, via email. Lastly, I would like to take this opportunity to promote the benefits of membership with FIP, including the events and webinars that uh, FIP hosts. FIP is the global body representing over 4 million pharmacists and pharmaceutical scientists and if you are a pharmacist or pharmaceutical scientist and you are not a member of FIP, I would strongly encourage you to do so at uh, FIP.org. Next slide, thank you. So uh, for this event, we are joined by a panel of fabulous speakers and I wanted to sincerely thank each of them for taking the time to prepare their uh, presentations for today's uh, webinar. Our first speaker is Lars Arke Sunderland, uh, he's Vice President of FIP from Sweden. We have Mr. Dara Connolly, he's the President of the Community Pharmacy Section uh, of FIP from Ireland. We have Mr. Christopher John, FIP Lead for Data and Intelligence from the United Kingdom. And we have Mr. Ruben Viegas, uh, FIP Practice Development Projects Coordinator from Spain. Next slide, thank you. So uh, for today's program, uh, we have a number of presentations. So firstly, uh, Lars will be talking about self-care as a pillar um, of universal health coverage. Dara will be providing a presentation on the role of community pharmacists in supporting informed self-care. Uh, Chris will be providing a summary of the online program, Shaping the Future of Self-Care Through Pharmacy. Uh, lastly, we have Ruben, he will be launching uh, the Empowering Self-Care Handbook for Pharmacists and introducing you to a, a number of other FIP resources. 
And uh, we'll also be finally um, hosting a Q&A at the end of the session with some closing remarks from our panelists. Next slide, thank you. Um, so a few learning objectives for tonight's session. Firstly, we will understand the contribution of self-care to universal health coverage, exploring the role of pharmacists in supporting uh, informed self-care, and lastly, showcasing FIP's material in uh, the area of self-care. So our first speaker uh, tonight is uh, Lars uh, Sunderland. So Lars is Vice President of FIP, he is co-chair of the FIP Congress Program Committee, immediate past president for the Community Pharmacy Section, as well as co-chair for the FIP Technology Forum. And congratulations, Lars. He's an extensive experience of working together with the Swedish healthcare sector in improving health and creating sustainable healthcare systems. He's been vice president of the Swedish Pharmaceutical Society and has a, had a number of executive positions with Apoteke, recently as head of National Customers New Business. Lars is president of the Swedish national project, Check My Medicines. He's a frequent speaker in Sweden and internationally regarding the future of healthcare and pharmacy. Uh, it's great to have you as a speaker for this webinar, Lars, and I will hand over to you for your presentation. Thank you so very much, Sara, for uh, that kind introduction. It's a great honor to be part of this uh, very important event as self-care is becoming more and more important uh, globally. Next slide, please. Well, uh, as you can see, um, WHO defines self-care as the ability of individuals, families and communities to promote health, prevent disease, maintain health, and to cope with illness and disability with or without the support of a healthcare provider. Next slide, please. 74 years ago, the World Health Organization was formed with the belief that health is a global concern and that we must work together to improve the well being of people in all corners of the earth to achieve universal health coverage. And the pandemic has been an object lesson in the importance of universal health coverage in promoting health for all and protecting everyone. And as governments and global bodies collectively work toward uh, universal health coverage, uh, discussions must include self-care as an important, if not critical, element in progressing toward our ultimate goal. So self-care equips people uh, to act as informed agents of and uh, protect their own health, prevent disease and treat illness both with and without the support of a healthcare provider. And the goal of universal health coverage is to ensure that all people attain the health services they need without suffering financial hardship when paying for them. This means a strong, efficient, well-run health system that meets priority health needs, affordability, a financing system to avoid financial hardship, access to essential medicines and other health technologies, and sufficient capacity or well-trained, motivated health workers to provide the services needed. Next slide, please. So defining self-care means that self-care refers to the holistic activities, practices, and products, both medicinal devices and nutritive that the person can adopt to improve their health and well-being. And self-care involves making healthy lifestyle choices, avoiding, avoiding unhealthy lifestyle habits, making responsible use of prescription and non-prescription medicines, self-recognition of symptoms, self-monitoring and self-management. Next slide, please. And uh, there are many benefits of healthcare and, and, and self-care, both for the healthcare system and for the patients as well. And the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated and emphasized the need for self-care interventions, interventions to alleviate an already, I would say, overburdened healthcare system. But the need for self-care uh, will remain long after the pandemic is over. The World Health Organization expects there to be a worldwide shortage of um, 18 million health workers by 2030, which can prevent the world from reaching the global uh, goal of universal health coverage. In 2017, the World Health Organization predicted that if the world continued on the same trajectory, less than half of the world's population will have access to basic and essential healthcare services by 2030. 
And this barrier to healthcare disproportionately uh, actually impacts people in underserved communities who are unable to work, to go to school, to support their families and spend time with their loved ones because they can't prevent or treat their ailments. And in the light of the unforeseen global pandemic, unless we take significant and immediate action today, this problem is going to get even worse before it gets better. That means we need to act today. One solution to the health worker shortage is for governments to promote and use evidence-based self-care intervention by support from the pharmacy. Not that long ago, I think you all remember that hospital wards were filled with people who had chronic conditions such as diabetes. Now, through information, knowledge and self-treatment, people can actually work in partnership with the healthcare system to self-manage their uh, health conditions at home. And this example just shows that self-care is a win-win where people get more control of their health and health systems can prioritize resources. Next slide, please. The attainment of better health for all cannot be achieved without an effective primary health care. The WHO declaration of Astana renewed global commitment to primary health care by all countries and states all around the world. And with pharmacy and the pharmacy workforce being integral to the deliver of quality primary health care, the International Pharmaceutical Federation, FIP, is leading pharmacies' commitment to the Astana Declaration. Primary health care addresses the health needs of all patients at the community level, integrating pre care, prevention, promotion, and education. So primary health care improves the performance of health systems by lowering the overall cost uh, while improving population health and access. And the aim of primary health care overlap with those of universal health coverage, which aims to ensure access to essential health services and safe, effective and affordable essential medicines and vaccines for all people. And to achieve universal health coverage, reforms should focus on strengthening primary health care to ensure equity and cost containment. And finally, health systems reforms should be monitored with clear indicators that reflect the core characteristics of primary health care, continuity of care, person and population centeredness, coordination of care, prevention, health promotion, and patient autonomy. Next slide, please. So a primary health care approach includes three components meeting people's health needs throughout their lives, addressing the broader determinants of health through multisectoral policy and action, and finally, empowering individuals, families, and communities to take charge of their own health. And by providing care in community, as well as care through the community, primary health care addresses not only individual and family health needs, but also the broader issue of public health and the needs of defined populations. And we find pharmacy across all sectors, pharmacy at all points of care, pharmacy equipped and able to deliver, as such pharmacy is part of the primary health care solution to universal health coverage at all levels. Next slide, please. So in conclusion, uh, universal health coverage and the say sustainable development goal number three can only be arguably accomplished with a robust focus on primary health care. And in goal number three, we also find the work of fighting the silent pandemic on the non-communicable diseases. Pharmacists can and should be part of the larger initiative to improve public health, particularly in reaching targets in sustainable goal number three, good health and well-being, ensure healthy lives and promote well-being for all at all ages through patient education and in being part of the policy development in every country. Next slide, please. The FIP primary health care strategy states that there is no primary health care without prevention, long-term condition management, self-care and acute exacerbation. So there is no primary health care without pharmacy in all sectors. And it's about 
the non-communicable diseases. It's about prevention and it is about patient safety. As such, the role of the pharmacist and self-care and areas for opportunity post-COVID can be identified in four areas that we will see on the next slide. It's about prevention, including vaccinations, detection of diseases, minor ailments, and the fight against chronic diseases or non-communicable diseases. Next slide, please. So where is the future of self-care? Well, linked to the rapid changes we have seen during the last years, we can at least identify three core areas. We have a changing healthcare landscape. We have individual empowerment of patients and consumers, and we have the importance of reaching universal health coverage uh, and healthcare via self-care. So there is a rapid evolution of technology that is transforming the delivery of healthcare. And as pharmacists and pharmacies, we need to be part of that um, revolution, I would say, and also drive this development in, in our communities. Of course, it's very important to have educated uh, consumers and patients because self-care enables individuals to become informed and active self-managers of their own health and health care. And of course, it's important to integrate self-care as a building block of universal health coverage to deliver improved quality of care and, of course, better outcomes. Next slide, please. So overall, I would say it's about the prominent role of our community pharmacies and pharmacists, digital technologies, and effective regulatory framework for self-care. Next, um, um, yeah, uh, self-care and pharmacy have to be included in every national health strategy, and it has to be written. And I'm sorry to say, if it isn't written, it doesn't actually exist. Next slide, please. So pharmacies have an excellent role in our communities because we are typically a patient's first point of contact with the healthcare system. We review, we prescribe, we dispense and administer um, prescriptions, and we are capable of modifying prescriptions and dispense alternative medicines without consulting a doctor in many countries to ensure the continuity of treatment. We have found and we are experiencing evolving roles, including education uh, of patients and providing primary care services to patients. And of course, we offer professional services, telepharmacy and medication deliveries to ensure the continuation of patient treatment, for example, for the non-communicable diseases. And as we all do, we stock appropriate products and promote disease prevention as well. Next slide, please. So, Technology is and will be an enabler for self-care and universal health coverage. There is a global trend of growing interest in self-care driven by increased use of digital technologies exacerbated by COVID-19 pandemic. And the WHO strategy focus also on accelerating the development and adoption of appropriate, accessible, affordable, and scalable and sustainable person-centric digital health solutions. We can also experience a, a trend towards developing an infrastructure and applications to enable countries to use health data to promote health and well-being. And of course, uh, we have experienced, all of us, an acceleration of use of digital technologies for information uh, purposes, such as the fast growth of applications, apps, to empower patients and consumers to manage their own health uh, more actively, live more independently thanks to self-assessment and remote monitoring solutions. So I would say that educated consumers and access to uh, products as well as a, a reliable and trustworthy healthcare professional like the pharmacist is key in the future of self-care. Next slide, please. So self-care is actually the pillar uh, to universal health coverage. And primary health care is a pillar within the self-care continuum, including prevention. And this, the, in this model, as you see on this screen, um, people are centered and empowered and professionals should assist them rather to take over in a paternist, paternalistic way. And it reflects the breadth of self-care from daily decisions uh, to lifestyle uh, choices, preventing disease and managing short-term and long-term conditions. And at the other end of the continuum represents fields where professionals have greater 
I would say, responsibility, acknowledging that self-care has a role throughout, apart from very rare exceptions. And as such, self-care is not a new concept, but and uh, nonetheless, it's pivotal to good health, well-being, and to the sustain sustainability of our health services. And our vision as pharmacists, as well as the vision for FIP, is to empower educate and equip people with ability to transform their health for a better life today, tomorrow, and well into the future for the improvement of society as a whole. So self-care is nothing less than living the healthiest, longest, most fulfilling life possible. And what could be a better aim for every national health system in the world, whatever structure and pharmacy is prepared to deliver. So as such, I think we need a new approach to healthcare that empowers people to look after their own health. And community pharmacy is where self-care happens to a huge extent. extent. Uh, next slide. So as such, self-care should be essential to the future of every healthcare system. Thank you. Thank you, Lars, for a, a fantastic presentation. I will come back with uh, questions at the end of uh, the session. Uh, our next speaker, uh, next slide, thank you. Uh, our next speaker is Mr. Dara Connolly. Uh, he's president of the FIP Community Pharmacy Section. Uh, so just a biography for Dara. He was elected as president of the Irish Pharmacy Union in May 2016 after serving a term of two years as vice president. Dara has been involved with the IPU since 2002, having experience on regional and national committees. He was elected to a four-year term to the Executive Committee of the Community Pharmacy Section of FIP in 2018 and as Section Vice President in 2020. Dara was Section Lead for the CPS uh, Vision 2025, uh, pharmacist at the heart of our communities. Dara's community pharmacy practice is in Dungarvan Co. Waterford, which is situated in the southeast of Ireland. He graduated from the School of Pharmacy, uh, University of Portsmouth in the United Kingdom in 1996. Dara is a third generation pharmacist uh, following his grandmother's in 1922 and father's 1959 footsteps. Dara is former, vice, um, former president sorry, of the Dungarvan and West Waterford Chamber of Commerce and a current chair of the Combined Total Health and Haven Community Pharmacy Cooperative with 125 members, Ireland's largest group. I hope I got that right, Dara. Uh, thank you, Dara. Now over to you for your presentation. Thank you. Dara, thank you very much for that very kind introduction. I'm now starting to feel quite old because I have just reminded I qualified not only in the last century as a pharmacist, it was actually in another millennium. But I suppose what that does mean is I have a little bit of experience when it comes to community pharmacy. Uh, I am really, really proud of the work that we have done in FIP and particularly in the community pharmacy section of being able to advocate for community pharmacists to do the best that they can for the communities that they serve. So if I could move to my first slide, I was delighted to be able to put the call out to pharmacists in every corner of the globe to send us in the community pharmacy section, a picture of pharmacists at their front doors of their pharmacies. So there's lots of people from around the world. The last one I saw flash up was we have a colleague from Haiti is talking to us this morning. And I hope that we did get, we did get people from all over the world at the open door of their pharmacy uh, for the front cover of our vision 2020 to 2025 which is pharmacists at the heart of our communities. What we have now is a context in 2022, where in some parts of the world, thankfully, we are starting to leave COVID behind. It is still a fatal and mortal disease, but we seem to be coming out at the right side of it. But what was little known to us at the time was, was that in the totality of healthcare, particularly in my country in Ireland, the only open door that people had to access the advice and the services of a healthcare professional was at their local community pharmacy. And I certainly know that that was the case in the majority of countries around the world. 
And I think as community pharmacists and as pharmacists in general, as we listen to this talk today about self-care, what we knew in 2020, when we put the vision together, we now know for certain that that is the truth, that the healthcare professional that people go to first and whose advice they trust the most because we are local to them is the community pharmacist. So I think we can be rightly proud of that. The, what I'd like to spend a few minutes talking about this morning is not so much about what self-care is, because I think that is being more than amply discussed and really well described by Lars Auka and will be described again by Chris and Ruben. What I'd like to spend a little bit of time about is that with the advocacy of allowing pharmacists to do more for the communities that they serve, we have a really good document in FIP, which is the community pharmacy vision, and it explains why pharmacists should be allowed to do more and pharmacists should be enabled to do more. So if we could move to the next slide, I'd like to give a little bit of context. And if I could zoom in on what happened in some countries, but not in all countries, and even in this room that I'm speaking to you from, I was able to give close on a thousand vaccinations, either for flu or for COVID in my community pharmacy, which is in a small town in a provincial area in Ireland. The nearest city is an hour away. And I was able to do that. And I was able to provide that service to my community in order to fight flu and in order to fight COVID. And I, my, me and my team are really proud that we were able to do that over that course of time. So the slide that you see here in front of you is the slide of the self-care continuum. And you've seen it in Lars Aukas and you may well see it again. But what I would like to particularly point out is it's 10 years since pharmacists were allowed to vaccinate in Ireland. And if you're in a country where you don't have the professional license to vaccinate just yet, I would like you to think around how you would make the argument to say that you do want to be able to do that and how you would go about it. So if we consider what is vaccination and how does it fit into the idea that we're talking about today, which is self-care, I certainly look at the left-hand side and I say to myself, is it a daily choice that somebody would make to be vaccinated? And the answer is no, but it probably does come into it at lifestyle and prevention. One of the things that we can probably fall into a trap of thinking is, and certainly I know that legislators do, is they think they, they say they're talking about a healthcare system, but what they're actually talking about is a sick care system. And what we really have in self-care is the antithesis of that, which is that it is real healthcare because it's preventative. So I would like to think that when we talk about self-care, the choice that somebody would make to go to their community pharmacy to have a vaccination either against flu or against COVID-19 is one that they're making in conjunction with their community pharmacists. And I think what it also means is, is that because people have access to that service, there is more chance that they will make the choice to go and have that done because of the open door of the community pharmacy and people have better access to community pharmacies than they do to GP surgeries or to vaccination centers, I think that that gives us a very strong argument to say that within the context of self-care, the more services that are available in the continuum of care at the community pharmacy, the better the outcome is. I would imagine a retrospective will be done, but I'm going to hazard an educated guess, and I'm going to say that there were better outcomes for population vaccination in countries where people could access their vaccination through their community pharmacies. And I'm delighted to say that in Ireland, we hit a 92% vaccination rate of adults uh, for first dose, second dose uh, for COVID-19, which we're very proud of. So the continuum of care I would stress is, is that the pharmacist will fit in with it in many, many areas. And just because we can't see vaccination written on that continuum of care, if we think about it and empower ourselves, it's there. So if I could move to my next slide. 
We have broken down, and this is a very busy slide, and you will be able to access it later on. It's, we have broken down what we do as pharmacists in community as essential pharmacy care. And what I really think is important in this is, is that we have broken down into four components, the really, really core function of what pharmacists do, which is we review medicines, we prescribe medicines, we dispense medicines, and we administer medicines. So if I could zone back in again and say, where does vaccination come into this or where does self-care come into this? If we have the ability to administer medicines, we can do more for people in the continuum of care. But we're not doing that in isolation. We're doing it in the context that we also review. We also prescribe medicines, because if you think somebody comes to us with a minor ailment, we then may recommend for example, the last thing that I would have done this morning before coming on this call is I was able to recommend uh, an antihistamine for a lady who had some urticaria. Because I am a community pharmacist and I had that conversation with her, I was able to prescribe for her. And the thing that we've kind of learned in the FIP CPS as well is sometimes there can be a little confusion over what prescribing is. So in some jurisdictions, pharmacists don't consider that they prescribe because there isn't a piece of paper that says that you must do the, the fact that we talk to people and we say, this is the medicine which you should have and this is how you should use it or take it, that is actually prescribing. So within that continuum of care, what we do within the context of essential pharmacy care is that lady decided that she was going to have a consultation with the pharmacist this morning about her urticaria and I was able to help her with the medicine that I prescribed. We only did that because we were able to review what her situation was. And if needs be, if she had come to me with urticaria, which had been complex because she was having an anaphylaxis, I could have administered a medicine to her. I could have administered adrenaline to her because I'm a vaccinating pharmacy. I'm qualified to do that. And I could have done that for her as an essential pharmacy service. The point that I would make with all of this is, is that the essential pharmacy care that we provide links in so closely and so nicely with the continuum of care that we see starting with self-care. To be able to make the argument for pharmacists to do more, I don't think you can make it in isolation from talking about what the continuum of care is, what self-care is, and what essential pharmacy care is. So if I could have my next slide. We have broken down how you would make the argument of allowing pharmacists to do more for the populations that they serve. So if you look at the top right-hand corner, the demographics of populations and professions says to us that if we're to serve that self-care need, we need to recognize that certainly in Ireland and in Western Europe, there seem to be fewer and fewer general practitioners. And it is very evident at the first point of care that people have is to the community pharmacy. Also, because we have a more educated population and also they trust their pharmacists now more than they ever did because of the services that we have provided through the pandemic, we can also see that they themselves need to access the continuum of care at a less complex point because they're more informed about their condition. If we go to the bottom right hand corner, we can know that there are proven improved outcomes for patients if they have that essential interaction with their community pharmacists. And I would highlight the minor ailment schemes that exist in countries like New Zealand or Canada or Scotland all around the world, or the improved access to emergency hormonal contraception, which is also self care. And then, of course, what we see is, again, and this comes after uh, when, when this point was written in 2020, when we see the improved outcomes of vaccination, we get better vaccination coverage when that can be done at a lower point of complexity within the continuum of care. So that is an improved outcome. If we go up to the top left-hand corner, we can also know through our own daily practice, pharmacists themselves, particularly community pharmacists, aren't used to their full potential, which is something then that isn't good within a healthcare system. 
because we're not moving people to the lowest point of complexity. And the harder it gets to treat people as we move them up the continuum of care, we need to be looking at after them at the lower end of complexity within the continuum of care. But a key point that I'd like to leave you think about as well is we will get more satisfaction as community pharmacists if we are enabled and empowered to look after people more through new services such as minor ailment services or vaccination services, contraception services. We will feel more professional satisfaction to be able to do that. And point then that I would make if we look to the bottom left hand corner, we can fall into a trap of talking about how brilliant pharmacists are and pharmacists should be allowed to do this and pharmacists should be allowed to do that. The most important people in the continuum of care aren't pharmacists, doctors, endocrinologists, or whatever it might be. It's actually the people who use the service. That's the communities that we serve. And anytime, anywhere, anybody around the world has gone out and asked the people who use the service who are in the continuum of care, the patient or the customer or the client, whatever you want to call them, they have always said that they want their pharmacists to do more. And I would imagine if we were to do that now into the future, having gone through COVID and the relationship that people have with their pharmacists post-COVID, I would imagine, I am certain of it, that we would be able to say that people want us to do even more than that. So just in summation, if I could go to my next slide, we ask ourselves then, what is the question, what is self-care? So rather than trying to define self-care, I would just like to move this on and say, where does the pharmacist, the community pharmacist fit into this? So self-care is defined as when taken by individuals of their own health and well-being at the lowest level of complexity with advice from a healthcare professional. So that is a pharmacist because we have the accessibility and we can give people the choice. What we say when we say the lowest level of complexity doesn't mean to say that what we're doing isn't complex. What we do is complex, and I suppose just in a way because we make it look easy, doesn't mean that it's hard. But I think that's really, really key to put across that it's the lowest level of complexity without it actually being non-complex. It is complex. So if we then think about it in terms of what a community pharmacist can do for people, it's about the decisions they make for themselves and their families, and who better to talk to other than a community pharmacist because you may have a relationship which isn't around healthcare with your community pharmacist, because we do lots of other things for people. If you then look at when we do those professional things for people, because we have the continuity of care and the continuum of care, we can help people through that journey, which starts at the left-hand side and sometimes, unfortunately, can end up on the right-hand side. The third point is that patients who are better informed and more educated progress greater motivation for self-care. If you trust the person from whom you are getting the information, and this is something that we know certainly now, and in many cases, unfortunately, through the COVID pandemic, that unfortunately people out there didn't trust the sources of information that they were getting and subsequently did not make good choices around their healthcare. People like to get their information from their community pharmacists. And then I suppose the final point then, the recognition and evaluation of symptoms is a key aspect of self-care. You can be listened to and understood better by your community pharmacist who knows you rather than somebody that you've never met before. So the final thing I want to leave you with on my last slide is, we are really, really well positioned to start conversations with people about their health care, about their self care, and about their well being. So I really like this. This is a little thing we ran, a publicity campaign we ran in Ireland three years ago with a set of emojis, just to spark that conversation with people as they came to the pharmacy to say, don't be afraid to ask your pharmacist about your health care. And what I really like about this is in terms of advocacy for pharmacy. You don't see the word health there and you don't see the word sickness. What you see there is be well this winter. But the story is telling you or what you can see from the emoji is something that we've all felt at a certain time. We didn't run this one in 2020 or 2021 because we didn't want people with symptoms like this coming to the pharmacy because it could have been COVID. But the point that I want to leave you with is, is that we are so well positioned to do this we need to tell our story and we need to back it up with a strategy and a vision 
And I'd like you to know that through FIP, that that strategy and vision exists. No matter where you are in the world, the core function that we look after is the same. And the vision that we all have for the practice of pharmacy is the same. Thank you very much, Dara. Um, always a great presentation from you. And uh, I love how, how passionate you are. Um, all right, we might move to our next speaker, uh, which is uh, Christopher John. Welcome, uh, Chris. So Chris is the FIP lead for uh, data and intelligence and is project manager for FIP, Global Pharmaceutical Observatory Project. He's also the account holder for FIP, European member organizations. Chris is a registered pharmacist in the United Kingdom and spent 25 years in its NHS working in hospital pharmacy, education and training, and workforce planning. Chris was also head of workforce policy and projects at the RPS, working on thought leadership, consultation responses, and standards guidance relating to the workforce. Chris has been an assessor on the Office for Students Teaching Excellence Framework, which assessed the quality of teaching and outcomes for students studying pharmacy, medicine, nursing and other healthcare subjects at universities. Chris is part of the core team that produced the FIP development goal and was involved with updating the FIP COVID treatment guidelines. Um, all right, over to you, Chris, thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Um, if we move over onto the next slide, I'll be providing a summary of the self-care program that was delivered by FAP over 2021 and early into 2022. It was called Shaping the Future of Self-Care Through Pharmacy. We've heard from Lars Orca and Dara that pharmacists contribute on a daily basis towards health systems being sustainable and universal health coverage. And they do this by supporting and empowering people, patients and consumers in making healthcare choices that we hope often and often do lead to optimal outcomes. This is part of their role all around the world and healthcare professionals or healthcare providers are at the heart of the community who deal with consultations on a variety of self-care areas in their practice. So as I've mentioned here at FIP, we delivered a program of digital events in 2021, 2022 called Shaping the Future of Self-Care Through Pharmacy, which included two series of events focusing on the policy elements and the practice elements of this role pharmacists and their pharmacy teams have. The first uh, series was uh, around the policy side uh, towards sustainable and universal health systems and coverage. And the second series was self-care support for community pharmacy teams, which focused more on the practice side, the clinical areas that are often dealt with on a day-to-day -day basis in pharmacies. We've produced summaries of all these events. If you want to hear any of them, they're still available on the FIP ed, um, website. And we also have some summaries that are, have been produced of all the events. If we move on to the next slide, you'll see with the first series, this was the Towards Sustainable and Universal Health Coverage uh, uh, series, which was the policy focus. You see the journey we went on uh, th through that series, moving from looking to the future, health literacy being a very important uh, topic, also personalized care, how we accelerate universal health coverage and the, how the current market looks. I think our, our aims of this particular series um, was to share and discuss strategies adopted by pharmacy leaders and workers, including FIP member organizations, to accelerating universal health coverage by enabling self-care, and also to describe sector or area-specific impl implications, innovations, and approaches adopted across practice, and to discuss the implications of optimizing self-care and the role of pharmacy. These events included a variety of international stakeholders and partners in the area of self-care, such as the Global Self-Care Federation, the International Self-Care Foundation, the Pharmaceutical Group of the European Union, and the Association of European Self-Care Industry, amongst others. The summary of the Towards Sustainable and Universal Health Systems and Coverage Self-Care Digital Events that we have published relates to the policy elements, as I mentioned, of pharmacist interventions in promoting informed self-care. 
a more detailed analysis of the drivers and barriers to the advancement of the role of pharmacists in self-care is also available in the FIP publication, Empowering Self-Care, a Handbook for Pharmacists. We will, of course, um, be providing lots of more information as the webinar goes on. But if we look at the next slide, I'll just give you some key themes and concepts that emerge from the firstly from the policy uh, series of the self-care events we ran. And, and you'll, this self-care continuum will be very familiar to you because Lars Orca and Dara have presented it to you. Um, uh, it's, but it's, it is very key to self-care. And as it is a continuum, I would also say one of the things that emerged from the events we ran was there's also a continuum of, of practice within self-care for pharmacists and their teams. You've heard about the definition of self-care, you've heard about where pharmacists fit in to self-care, but there is some variation across the globe as to the focus of the support pharmacists can provide for self-care. So if we click through on the slide, you'll see in, in some countries, this focus is really around self-managed ailments, minor ailments, and in other countries, if we click again, you can see it expands. And you've heard uh, Dara mention that in some cases, he is qualified to deal with acute situations such as anaphylaxis. But in, 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 there is um, a variety in the breadth of uh, practice for self-care. And self-care, as I mentioned, is an important contributor to universal health coverage through savings in healthcare expenditure and the reallocation of resources by means of reduced use and pressure on the healthcare system. So that's a key policy element that arose during the events. Often informed choices of non-prescription medicines can reduce emergency department visits from patients seeking consultation for minor ailments and less than the reliance on prescription only medicines. So policy should also highlight how engaging in informed self-care can improve health and well-being in complement with the formal healthcare system. And countries can promote self-care by providing populations with effective, efficient, and inclusive primary healthcare services, quality healthcare information, which links to the health literacy element I mentioned, and accessible preventative care and supplementary care services through community pharmacies. If we move on to the next slide, you'll see another key concept that arose during the first series of events that I mentioned, which is the seven pillars of self-care. And the International Self-Care Foundation has developed a framework, which they call the seven pillars for self-care. These pillars or domains, if you uh, want to call them, uh, um, it should be emphasized that they were, have been designed to describe the entire range of self-care activities, individual circumstances and, con and, and conditions uh, country conditions mean that self-care practices, as I've mentioned, vary considerably around the world. Self-care practices in resource-poor countries are inevitably somewhat different to those of richer countries, for example, but there are a few circumstances in which people should not consider their and their family's health and well-being and try to move in a positive direction uh, within these pillars, and these pillars can support policy development as well. Self-care can be developed nationally through minor ailment schemes, evaluation of processes and, and noting where you are, you can plan effectively future approaches. Limitations for the development of the role of pharmacists in self-care can be either from a regulatory perspective or a workforce motivation perspective. There are a few countries with national self-care integrated policies and community pharmacies can play an important role in providing data and research to support those policies. Consumers can better use digital technologies if policies and regulations support individual health literacy. On the next slide, you'll see some of the self-care enablers that have been identified from our events, um, which will help take us towards sustainable and universal health coverage. Self-care does not mean no care. Uh, the series identified a number of important enablers, including digital health literacy, both in pharmacists and consumers, and these should enable people to access health services. Health policy is another enabler. Some nations have developed policy in this area, not enough, as Lars Orca has mentioned. 
pharmacy is integral to the healthcare system, which supports self-care. And as has been previously mentioned, you only have to look at the COVID-19 pandemic to understand that. Community assets are also important. This might include green spaces, gyms, other assets. Regulations are important. What medicines should be available over the counter was one of our most popular events, and we had a, a very interesting discussion about that. And empowerment and choice includes sharing, shared decision making. So patients, consumers, and people's perspectives across self-care are essential. And we've we add some patient perspectives within the self-care event. Moving on to the next slide, you'll see self-care support for community pharmacy teams was our second series of self-care events. And here our aim was to provide relevant information, guidance and updates for pharmacists and the pharmacy workforce on self-care so they can take a person-centered approach. And that's uh, incredibly important. We also intended to describe sector or area specific implications, innovations and approaches adopted across practice and to engage frontline workers of the health and pharmacy workforces to, to know about the self-care realities facing them around the world. We also discussed the implications of optimizing self-care and the role of pharmacy. And we wanted to consider common conditions and how they can be supported through self-care. We also wanted to assess and discuss the evidence behind treatments used in self-care. So these events covered a, a range of clinical areas of common conditions um, that community pharmacists and their teams see. And they included experts with different academic or professional backgrounds who shared their expertise on how pharmacists can have a direct impact on patients' well, well-being through self-care. As we've heard, community pharmacists are often the first point of contact with healthcare professional for consultations and a, tri a triage of common ailments and for requests for advice on non-prescription medicines. And indeed, my grandfather was um, running a community pharmacy in London in the United Kingdom before the National Health Service was even implemented in the country. So he was supporting self-care before it was probably even a term. So this is an important role which leverages the accessibility of community pharmacists and the trust placed upon them by the population. It delivers great value, not only for patients and consumers, but also for healthcare systems and society as a whole. These consultations and advice contribute to empowering patients and consumers to make informed choices about their health and live healthier lives. So to choose the most appropriate non-prescription treatments and achieve the best possible outcomes from them, and ultimately to reduce the pressure on general practitioners or family positions, if you use that term in your country, and emergency departments. Acknowledging the importance of the role, the International Pharmaceutical Federation has placed great emphasis on advocating for adequate recognition for the role of pharmacists in self-care, but also on providing practicing pharmacists with resources to support it and facilitate its implementation in practice. So we hope you'll be able to have a look at these events, that any that which pique your interest. And as I say, there's a brief summary of the two series. Please do visit the FIB website and have a good look and listen to the events. Thank you so much. Thanks very much, Chris, uh, for sharing, for sharing uh, your presentation. Okay, we might move on uh, to our next presenter, Ruben uh, Viegas. He's the uh, FIP Practice Development Project Coordinator. Uh, Ruben is a pharmacist from Portugal uh, with a master's degree in exercise and health from the Faculty of Human Kinetics in Lisbon. He's currently enrolled in a PhD program focusing on the promotion of physical activity through pharmacists. He has been involved in different associations and educational activities focusing on the area of public health and pharmacy practice. Um, thank you, Ruben, over to you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here uh, with you today, this morning or this evening. So uh, following uh, uh, Chris's presentation, uh, we have a resource, a new resource that is being launched today that is uh, entitled Empowering Self-Care, a Handbook for Pharmacists. 
um, this uh, publication is in line with the two series that uh, Chris explained before. So we have one part that is more about the concepts and the frameworks uh, on the beginning of the publication. And then we have uh, later on the publication, different areas that also Chris uh, mentioned. Uh, we had, I think it was nine areas that were covered in the events. Unfortunately, we couldn't cover uh, everything in this publication. So we chose six main areas uh, that we could provide an overview. Um, so this, this publication also had the contribution from several experts from uh, those events that provided inputs and expertise in the different areas. And it's a very practical tool that aims to support pharmacists uh, both in understanding these more conceptual uh, elements and, and the definitions of, of self-care and interventions as well. And also in the different areas, it has an overview I will explain uh, uh, later. But uh, of course, each country may, might have different practices around the, those areas, but it provides a high level overview of, of these areas. So uh, this part of the introductory chapters focus more on the frameworks. You saw already the self-care uh, continuum, which is number three on this uh, first uh, self-care matrix, which is a framework that combines different uh, frameworks. You also saw the pillars. So um, the first chapter is basically definitions, important uh, documents from other organizations such as WHO or the Global Self-Care Federation. So you can see all of those in there. The second chapter is more about the evolution of self-care. So as Lazak also mentioned in the beginning, the trends in self-care, how it contributes to universal health coverage, and also the barriers uh, that, that pharmacists might face in order to advance these services. And the third chapter is a bit on the role of pharmacists in supporting uh, self-care, and also how um, FIP, for example, can provide these resources, resources like this handbook, to help uh, then the members, individual members, the national organizations to follow up on, on, on this work. Uh, after these chapters, we have six different chapters on specific conditions, so sore throat, gastrointestinal complaints, musculoskeletal pain, children's fever, sexual health, and disinfection of the pharmacy. They are broad areas that encompass um, different symptoms uh, and sometimes different ways of acting. So in each of these chapters, we try to include short introduction, then the signs and the symptoms, so pharmacists are aware of how they look like and what they might expect people come to them uh, complaining about or asking about uh, a triage that includes a flowchart that you'll see on the next slide. Uh, again, this flowchart is very generic in your, uh, but it, we also aim to provide this. So for example, you could print the flowchart and then add specific points, uh, how you proceed uh, in your pharmacies. And then two blocks, one for the, the most common pharmacologic pharmacological management options. And the second point that is also very important on the non-pharmacological uh, management uh, and approaches for these conditions. A last block uh, has the useful resources and links because in some of these conditions, there are many resources available from WHO or specific organizations. So it's also uh, there on the end of the chapter for further reading or more information. So starting on sore throat, you can see the example on the, on the right for the flowchart. Maybe it's not very visible, but you can uh, look at it with detail on the, on the publication. For sore throats, the key highlights are the important link with antimicrobial resistance, because sometimes uh, patients might come to the pharmacy with a sore throat and, and request an antibiotic. Uh, and do not understand that they might need probably to get tested. They will need to go to the, the, the GP to get this prescription to check if it's needed. Uh, in some countries, there are also uh, testing available in the pharmacy, so you can do a quick test and see. Uh, so this area, it has an important link with the antimicrobial disease, uh, resistance. Uh, then uh, it has also this part of assessing the severity of symptoms. Normally, most times, uh, when people also from my experience in community pharmacy, uh, sore throat is uh, easily managed in the community through lozenges or anti-inflammatories or 
over-the-counter uh, or non-prescription medicines, but sometimes there might be a need for uh, for referral and it's uh, there on the publication which uh, are these situations. And then, as I said, the non-pharmacological uh, options are also important, how to soothe the throat, how to keep it hydrated so you don't get a, a sore throat very often. Another um, area is the gastrointestinal complaints, and these can vary from the upper uh, digestive tract from reflux uh, or stomach problems to diarrhea or constipation. So it has really a variety of, uh, of symptoms that, that can also have multiple causes. It can be uh, for a lack of uh, exercise or from nutrition. So it, it really depends and it has a broad, uh, a broad uh, group of symptoms. So on this, it's important to really uh, invest some time on, on the questions. So trying to try as a difference, uh, assessing the causes for, for the gastrointestinal complaints. And of course, the nutritional advice, it's, it, normally it's very important uh, as it can, it can support the non-pharmacological management of these conditions. For musculoskeletal pain, uh, we have this condition that has a high burden, not only in older people, but also uh, younger people uh, have also a high incidence of, of, of pain, especially low back pain from occupational activities. For example, everyone now works in the computer. And then when you notice you have a chronic uh, back pain, um, as pharmacists, there are different formulations, different products, uh, from patches to creams to ointments to uh, tablets. So there are quite a lot of opportunities to uh, manage musculoskeletal pain and also referral to the community because sometimes there might be a need for uh, further involvement in uh, physiotherapy, for example, or other, other, uh, other options. And uh, it's also noted that exercise here, it's, it can be a good support tool for people uh, living with musculoskeletal pain. Moving on, we have another uh, area, which is the children's fever. The flowchart is a bit smaller because it's uh, normally, it, it has a, a smaller scope of, of uh, intervention. Uh, sometimes it's also about uh, trying to reassure parents that uh, because they might be worried that their child has a fever or is unwell. Um, so pharmacies here can provide good advice on the, checking the temperature, uh, looking at the child, ensuring that the, the child is comfortable. And uh, one important key aspect that was also brought from the event is that the use of paracetamol of, of, or ibuprofen should only be considered when the children is um, in, uncomfortable or distressed. So should not be the first thing to do, uh, only uh, used uh, if needed. And then of course, if there are red flag symptoms that you see on the right side, uh, they should be referred and, and looked up by a, a doctor. Another chapter is sexual health. Uh, again, here is a very broad, uh, when we talk about sexual health related issues, uh, they differ in prevalence according to uh, sexual orientation, gender identity, sexual expression, relationships. So it's, it's a very wide area. Um, normally, these, these issues, uh, if, if there's privacy to discuss them, uh, it's, it's normally more comfortable for, for the clients, uh, the, the customers, patients visiting the, the, the pharmacy. So if the pharmacy has a, a, cons a private consultation room, sometimes these conversations might happen there. And uh, um, some countries have also testing for uh, as sexual transmitted infections, for example, uh, or for uh, HIV. And um, if not available, then pharmacies also have a, a quite an important role in referring to the community so people can get this, this follow-up and can uh, do the testing, maybe come back to the pharmacy and then go back again. So this referral and this follow-up is also quite important in this area of um, sexual health, for example, and specifically in the sexual transmitted infections. <clears throat> Lastly, we have disinfection. So disinfection, especially now with the, the, the COVID pandemic uh, was brought up, uh, the importance of keeping uh, 
the surfaces of the, the, the pharmacy clean and disinfected, not only the surfaces, but also the hands, the hand washing, the face masks. So disinfection can be a good tool to reduce the transmission of different diseases. Uh, as you see in the table and you'll see on the publication as well, there's different disinfectants uh, that can be used for different surfaces for the skin or for the hands or for uh, depending on, on where we are disinfecting. And then there's also in the publication a list of roles that pharmacists can play in this area. But education is probably one of the most important ones where pharmacists can really um, edu educate patients and consumers in this area of disinfection. So if you want to take a look at this publication, you'll see on FIP social media, you can follow the link at fip.org uh, file 5111. You can also uh, check the QR code if you have your phone at hand uh, and you can, uh, you can see that you'll have all this information in there, also a lot of references. So it's a very uh, compact work with a lot of expertise from different experts. So you can, you can take a look at it. Uh, a recent, so there are uh, more uh, resources, but a very recent one is this one as well, the FIP Cold Flu and Sinusitis Handbook. Um, you can also check it on the link below or uh, again in this QR code. This is another resource on the area of self-care that was uh, launched a couple of months ago. And it also focuses on the management of these conditions, um, the, the similarities uh, between them, uh, and also uh, with a little note on, on the COVID-19. And just an, as, as an example, there's also a flow chart that you can see the different symptoms and you can see if they're present or not. You might want to refer, you might want to consider that it's probably um, more likely to be a flu or to be a cold or to be um, a sinusitis. So uh, this uh, is a great tool to have. You can also have it on your, uh, on your pharmacy. And again, you can might take notes uh, with a pen uh, depending on, on, on the specificities of, of your pharmacy. So again, if you want to take a look at it, you can also check it both in the FIP website or in the prevention microsite, which is my last, um, my last point for today. So uh, FIP has a, a selection of uh, resources in self-care in this microsite, in this uh, website, prevention.fip.org, in the area of uh, self-care. So if you're interested only in the resources for self-care, then you can go to this prevention website that also has a different tab for vaccination and for vector-borne diseases. But now that we're focusing on self-care, uh, you can see in this tab uh, all the publications that are mentioned and more. And you can see also the different events and webinars that uh, here on the image, you see the, the one in of sore throat, for example, on November 23. So you can check the, the microsite on prevention following self-care, but you can also find all these publications and all these resources in the FIP library. And I think that is it for me. Back to you, Sarah. Thank you. Thank you, Ruben. Um, that was um, a great presentation and showcasing the, uh, the documents and the resources that uh, pharmacists can utilize uh, in this area and highlighting uh, self-care. Okay, we might move to our Q&A and uh, for all of our panelists, uh, please uh, turn on your cameras. So we've had a number of questions come through and uh, I might uh, ask each of you individually to answer a question. And first, uh, if Dara is there, uh, I will ask him the first question. Um, so Dara, uh, one of the comments that's come through, um, fully agree on the important role of community pharmacists in relation to self-care. Uh, as especially seen through last year, could you share your thoughts on what the needs of pharmacists are in order to feel fully equipped or empowered to recommend and prescribe products and solutions to their customers? Thanks, Sarah. <clears throat> and certainly thanks to Ellie Schaefer for a really good question. Uh, 
pharmacists being empowered to do the best that they can for the people that they serve hinges on number one, their ability to form a rapport with that patient and ultimately to diagnose what the problem is. Now that can come from a first interaction with somebody. So if it's to be the case, like I'm giving an example of just because it's one that I had this morning with the lady with urticaria, I diagnosed urticaria and I was empowered because of legislation in Ireland that I was able to recommend for her an antihistamine cream and a non-drowsy antihistamine, which she was happy to take. Now, if I were in another country, or maybe in Ireland, if I knew that patient, and she had had this before, and she had a course of oral steroids, that may have been appropriate for me to then re-prescribe for her. So the two things are, and I think it probably blends in a little bit with the question below from Luis Bio is what is it that pharmacists can do and where, and where do we differ? So I think number one is we prove our value through our education and our ability to serve as that's recognized within regulation and to show what we do already is doing very good for people. And then secondly, our own access to the scheduling of the medicines that are available is the next step that comes with it. There is a little bit of chicken and an egg that goes with it, but number one is certainly the status of the education and the skills of pharmacists in the individual countries. Not only does it need to exist, it needs to be recognized. And that's what pharmacists need to do is to go out there and say, we can do this and we can do more, and here's the proof. Absolutely. Thank you, Dara. Um, and that probably leads into my next question for Lars. Um, so Lars, integrating uh, self-care into uh, the competencies of pharmacists and in pharmacy education uh, is promising uh, to boost self-care principles at a healthcare system level. So how can we ensure that uh, knowledge and skills of the pharmacy team in self-care are sufficient to deliver services? Well, I think there are many different uh, perspectives uh, uh, on that um, question, actually. First, I would like to say that I think that uh, perhaps uh, six barriers currently exist. I mean, the workload, deficiency, uh, remuneration, uh, uh, and education, perceptions of the pharmacy workforce, as well as interprofessional uh, teamwork and health literacy. All those these barriers uh, actually affect uh, and the role and the position of the pharmacist within the self-care continuum. Uh, and as such, I think it's very important to, to actually link to the COVID-19 pandemic. We need to develop a blueprint for, self, for a self-care strategy because the COVID-19 pandemic has had a significant impact on the wage, ways in which uh, many governments actually promote and the public today consider self-care. So, uh, I, I mean, during the pandemic, uh, the message from many governments was stay at home, protect our health system and save lives. That was a message of self-care. And in response, following the ways of the pandemic, we have now seen how many people actually turn to community pharmacies for support and help. And, and uh, uh, the many say also that they are likely to do so even more in the future. So going forward to the health systems recovery and many governments' long-term aspirations, I think it will be critical that these new behaviors are integrated into how people interact with our healthcare systems and pharmacies. And uh, I hope that within five to 10 years time, individuals should understand and be willing to practice self-care, knowing how to take care of themselves and where to go to the pharmacy when they are feeling unwell. And there should be also a cultural shift among healthcare professionals Toward well, towards well-being and away from the sort of biomedical model of care, supporting individuals to incorporate self-care and stay healthy as long as possible. And 
the system should also be designed to support self-care with pharmacy being much more integrated into the primary healthcare pathway and clear routes to self-care across primary and secondary care. And also I believe that digital technology should be used to its fullest potential to encourage self-care wherever appropriate, empowering individuals to consider options for self-care at all points uh, on the care pathway. And to meet all these, I would say, ambitions, the rigid pa patient pathways, unnecessary prescribing habits and persevering perceptions of hierarchies in the healthcare systems that we have must all be done away with. And a new system needs to be created, which fully integrates the promotion of everyday well-being, self-care for self-treatable conditions, and also the management of long-term conditions into the wider healthcare system. So we need a new blueprint where pharmacy is central in this perspective. Thank you, Lars. Uh, okay, we might move to the next question from Chris. Um, so, uh, Chris, I believe you touched on it in your presentation around uh, the limitations for pharmacists, such as uh, policy and regulations. Um, and one of the questions that's come through are around the barriers that need to be addressed um, and how ideally these could be overcome uh, in relation to self-care. I, I know Dara and Lars have already touched on a few of these, but perhaps you could expand on that a little bit more. Sure. I mean, I... I think I prefer to talk about enablers rather than barriers, because I think there is a lot already been done by pharmacists. So how can we make it even better? So I think, uh, and this has been mentioned, a lot of what I'm going to say has been mentioned earlier on, but I think um, digital health has really increased in, in importance in the last couple of years. And we need to ensure the pharmacy workforce is very digitally um, with it, so to speak, and can uh, address a, a digital health approach to supporting patients with self-care because increasingly that's that's becoming very important. We have certainly in the UK, there's a lot more digital video consultations now on offer from community pharmacies. So that's that's a key enabler. We need the tech and there are a number of companies providing the tech, but obviously then we need the fund, the tech funding. A lot of countries don't have any policy health wise health policy on self care. We certainly need that. Health systems need to recognize, as has been said, pharmacy's role in primary health care and in supporting self care, not just the health system, as we said, the other healthcare professionals. I think that is has again improved on the, on the last few years. Patient perceptions, I think Lars uh, Oker alluded to this, are important. I think it's important they don't see pharmacy as a second best to the family physician or a second best to the emergency department. Pharmacy is they'll get the right service at the right time and they'll get the right advice and they'll get sorted. And we've got a lot of evidence to show that is the case for supporting self-care. It's, I mean, it's not exactly. just medicines, it's supporting, there's other enablers as well. And that I suppose is lead to more of the lifestyle advice and we need to um, be able to support people with changing behaviors and leading healthy uh, lifestyles and empowering them and giving them the choice. So it's having, having pharmacies and the pharmacy workforce available is something, you know, it's, a, it's such an obvious thing, perhaps we've overlooked it a bit. We've got to have far, enough pharmacies and the pharmacy workforce around the world to support this. And we've got to have access to medicines that can support it as well. So that there would be the enablers, I would say. Absolutely, thanks, Chris. And I liked how you flipped my question uh, to take a, a more positive, uh, more positive turn. All right, uh, my next question is uh, for Ruben. Um, so one of the questions Ruben has come through um, is around uh, sexual health. And um, uh, the, the comment is, I maintain that self-care support, especially sexual health, could be sensitive um, with privacy problems. So patients do not uh, tend to share the information. So um, the question is, uh, what is the strategy to share the information with patients uh, through community pharmacy or as a community pharmacist? Thank you, Sarah. Thank you for the question. 
Uh, indeed, uh, some pharmacies, especially the most uh, busy ones, might have a line of uh, five to 10 people. And then the person that is uh, in front of the line does not feel comfortable because there are many people around uh, to share these kind of, of, of issues. So I think the first um, most obvious solution is if the pharmacy has uh, a private consultation room, then uh, these issues can be uh, transferred and the conversation can can go there. Of course, this also takes time from the pharmacist, but it's a solution, especially for these uh, for these cases. If this is not possible, then what I used to suggest uh, in, in the pharmacies I work was to have some kind of support. It is written, for example, it could be a small flyer saying, uh, do you have sexual health problems? Then you can reach us uh, this phone or this email or uh, so leaving, uh, opening another way of conversation that can also uh, um, that does need to be right away. The person can come back or they can schedule an appointment for a certain time. So trying to uh, open uh, communication channels and, and ways to enhance the privacy that these matters normally uh, require. Thank you, Ruben. Um, okay, we will move to uh, Dara next. Um, okay, so uh, Dara, one question uh, that was around uh, resistance uh, with other healthcare providers, but I might just change the question slightly and ask, uh, what has been your experience uh, with other healthcare providers in supporting um, individual self-care or patient self-care uh, at the community level, so through your work in community pharmacy? Yeah, really good question, because none of us works as a healthcare professional in isolation. We're part of a network of care, a continuum of care, and i not trying to sound too smart. It depends who you're talking about. So in my small town, there are eight general practitioners and there are seven other pharmacies. And I have a very good and close working relationship with those general practitioners and those other pharmacists as well. We, through the COVID pandemic, have been able to get into the 21st century and we now have electronic prescribing. Now, with that, I will hasten to say that electronic prescribing is really is just a glorified email, but at least it has a legal standing and it is a legal prescription. So that has been a huge benefit to us in our working relationship with the general practitioners, because in previous times, we would have had to say that the written prescription that was presented to us by a human being with a piece of paper that had just been written with a bio and pen 20 minutes beforehand, the first time that we would have to be able to get back to the general practitioner to say that there was an issue of patient safety or whatever it might be with that prescription was when the patient was straight in front of us. Because we now have what's called health mail and electronic prescribing, we see the prescription before we see the patient. So anything that needs to be done can be sorted out via email with the prescriber. What that means then for the relationship that I have with those prescribers in my community is, is it was good beforehand, but now it's even better because we have a clear line of communication where there isn't a patient in front of me with the problem and there isn't a patient in front of them who's another patient with another problem. So to answer the question on the ground, my interaction with those GPs is now better than it ever was. And the second reason why it's better than it ever was is, is that because of all the work that they have taken on to look after people during COVID-19, they are very happy to see some of the administrative burden, particularly around the pre-prescriptions, that that would come on to us as community pharmacists. We are happy to do it because it actually makes our life easier. So at that level, we are getting on better than we ever have with those other healthcare professionals within the continuum of care here at ground level. Now, which will have it, this now will have a resonance with everybody listening in, no matter where they are in the world. If I then go onto a radio talk show to advocate for pharmacy services, to provide better services for people, somebody who is a member of the Irish Medical Association will come on and say that people are going to die and pharmacists aren't qualified to do it even though on the ground I know that that isn't the truth and nobody under, who is a member of that organization actually believes that anyway, because they have their own political axe to grind. What I will say is, is that because of COVID and the change that we've all had to adopt, 
we're getting less and less of that as we advocate for more pharmacy services like the minor ailment scheme. And what I would probably leave it with as well is to say that we can all wait for particular enablers to happen with our own, within our own countries, which would be to say, if only we had electronic prescribing, we could do a minor ailment scheme. I think you've just got to go out there and advocate for what pharmacists can do with the tools that we have. Because we were six months away from having electronic prescribing in Ireland for about 12 years, and we had it within six weeks of COVID happening. So if you wait for the perfect scenario for you to do your perfect job, it's never going to happen. Go out and advocate now for the services that you can offer to your community. Thank you, Dara. And I believe, Lars, you wanted to uh, comment? Yes, uh, we all know that pharmacists uh, have the knowledge and skills to help uh, with many healthcare conditions and uh, people don't actually need to an, an appointment to speak to a pharmacist. And of mm -hmm. course, visiting a pharmacist first helps to make the more GP appointments available for people with more complex healthcare needs. So, so as a comment to, to Derek's um, um, expression here, I would say that perhaps explaining how we add value to team-based care as medication use experts could be extraordinarily helpful in turning uh, what I would say the tide, because I wonder if self-care should be defined as being something that is achieved in collaboration with a pharmacy and our pharmacists, because that could help change consumer perceptions of pharmacists as well. And if, if, if we as a profession just make that connection every time self-care is talked about, it would begin to build perception in health consumers' mind that self-care is something that is achieved in collaboration with the pharmacist. And perhaps also the creation of, the, of a dedicated community consultant pharmacist role can be considered to be a viable option in which pharmacists offer advice to health consumers without perhaps even dispensing a medicine. Thank you, Lars, and, and thank you to our panelists. Um, now we've got a couple of minutes to go and uh, we might move to um, the wrap up and conclusions. But before we do so, I was hoping uh, to ask for a final take home message from each of you. Um, so just around the importance of self-care in pharmacy practice uh, and how can pharmac pharmacists best utilize and access the FIP self-care resources and educational materials and, uh, and utilize those in practice. So I might ask uh, Chris first, if you could uh, share 30 seconds as a summary. I would say um, no matter where you are on, on the continuum of your scope of practice, how wide it is around or narrow around self-care, this is, this is number one really in practice in primary care for pharmacists. So it's, and it's essential. So that, that would be my summary very briefly. And um, I think you'll see that if you visit the FIP events and webinars from the series and, and see the handbook, it's, it's, it's an essential, essential area. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Ruben? Yes, thank you. So uh, my message is just uh, for the individual pharmacies to get involved in their national level, regional level, so they can also shape the global level and we can also align the priorities and the, the resources that we're producing with the needs of the different countries. And don't be afraid to uh, share, the links are on the, on the chat. So share these, these, uh, these, these resources and, and let's hope that they're, they're useful. Thank you. Thanks, Ruben. Last? Well, I think there are several key factors uh, shaping the future of self-care. Uh, the global population is aging uh, with an ever greater need for better chronic disease management. And at the same time, the consumer journey is rapidly evolving, impacting how individuals actually interact with healthcare providers and pharmacy. And in I would, what I would call an omnichannel world, people want uh, convenient, transparent, and affordable options at the fingertips. And the explosion of data-driven solutions also mean that individuals have come to expect a more holistic, personalized solution across every aspect of their lives. And pharmacy is here, ready to serve, and the benefits of self-care can be such, uh, said to be threefold, better choice, better care, better value with pharmacy. Excellent. Thank you, Lars. And uh, lastly, Dara. 
Yeah, I'd agree with the, the previous presenters, everything that they've said. So rather than uh, 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 replicate what they've said, I firmly believe in everybody in the community pharmacy section in FIP and FIP as a whole recognizes that the best people to advocate for the progress and the advance of the profession of pharmacy are pharmacists. We can't wait for other people to promote who we are and what we do. We must do that for ourselves. And the only way that we can remain relevant and do a better job is by challenging ourselves, such as through conversations that we're having today, to say, what is it we can do that we can do more and we can be more relevant? And to everybody listening today is, I get my energy and my invigoration as a community pharmacist not only from the patients and people that I serve, but also from talking to other pharmacists and having conversations like we're having now. And just to let everybody know that the fantastic resources that are there within FIP will help you to have those conversations and help you to challenge yourself to say, how can I do more for the people that I serve? Excellent, thank you, Dara. Um, next slide, thank you. So um, lastly, I'd just like to uh, thank all of our uh, panelists and, and our attendees for tonight's session. Um, the recording of this episode will be made available on www.fip.org. And please provide your feedback to webinars at fip.org uh, so we may continue to improve our digital events offering in future. Again, one last thank you uh, for your attendance and to our brilliant speakers, a great rest of the week to you all. and. Uh, uh, make sure you access the self-care resources on FIP's website. Take care. Good night.